Well, God bless you, everyone. I'm so glad that you're able to join me. Listen, this was supposed to have been for our Wednesday. And so I'm just now taping as I was studying about this. Um, and so I do I apologize for my lateness again. Um, Y'all, I'm going to get it right. I'm going to get it right. But let's go into a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, O oh God. For, Lord, everything that you have done, God, everything that you're going to do, God, bless this word, God. Bless the souls, oh God, that, Lord God, are in need right now, God. Lord, whatever the situation is, God, I pray, God, that you would be the right now, God, that they need you to be, God. I ask, oh God, that you would turn every situation, God, around, oh God, that was coming against them, oh God. Turn it in their favor, God. Deliver them out of the snares and the traps, oh God, that the enemy has set for them, God. Lord, I ask, oh God, that you would build them up upon their most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. I ask, oh God, that you would give them victory right now, God. I ask, oh God, that you would let no circumstance, no situation, no individual, God, count them out or defeat them, oh God. I ask, oh God, that you would just enlighten them, God, and breathe upon them, breathe upon this situation, God. I ask, oh God, that you would bless them, Lord God. Oh God, I ask, oh God, that you would bless them exceedingly above all they can ask or think. I ask, God, in the name of Jesus, yes, God, that you would protect them and their family members from, Lord, danger, seen and unseen, God, that you would cancel, Lord God, the assignment of the enemy, God. I ask, oh God, that you would cover their thoughts in their mind, God, with your word, God. I ask, oh God, that you would defeat every purpose of the enemy, God, to bring them down, Lord God, to destroy their faith, to destroy, Lord God, even, Lord God, their walk in you, Christ Jesus. Lord, I ask, oh God, that you would cover them under the shadow of thy wings, God. I ask, oh God, that you would bless them in spite of, God, every attack that is coming against them, God. I ask, God, that you would just send your deliverance right now in the name of Jesus, for this is our, this is the victory of our faith which overcometh the world. Lord, I ask, oh God, that you would be the very present help in the time of trouble, I ask, oh God, that you would lift their head above the waters, oh God, above, Lord God, every attack, above every problem, God. Cause them, Lord God, to walk in the anointing and the power, Lord God, of the Holy Ghost, God. Cause them, Lord God, to overcome every pitfall and every snare the enemy has set for their life and for their family's life. Deliver them out of every addiction, God. Deliver them out of every, Lord God, attack, Lord God. Lord, in the name of Jesus, oh God, I declare that a creed of victory for them right now in the name of Jesus. And Lord God, I ask that you would supply all of their need according to your riches and glory, God. I ask, oh God, that you make rivers in the desert, God. I ask that you would bless even those, oh God, where the hand of the enemy, oh God, was fighting, Lord God, even their marriages, oh God, that you would come against, oh God, the annihilated, Lord God, and even, Lord God, the Lord God, interfere of their marriage, oh God, to cause them to be at odds, God. I ask, oh God, that you would heal the marriages right now, Heavenly Father. Lord God, for two, see if he is one. Oh God, in the name of Jesus, oh God, heal, Lord God, the relationship, Lord God, between mothers and sons and mothers and daughters, fathers and sons and fathers and daughters. Heal relationships, oh God, in families, oh God. Send restoration, God, in the name of Jesus, yes, God, for you put the isolated, God, and the solitary and families. Lord, in the name of Jesus, oh, strengthen the families today, God. Oh, God, sin, Lord, God, healing to the brokenness of the families today, God. Oh, Satan, the Lord, rebuke you right now in the name of Jesus. We cast out the spirit, Lord, God, of sibling rivalry and discord in the name of Jesus and miscommunication and misunderstandings, God, and we bring unity in the families, the unity of God and the bond of perfectness, which is the love of God. Lord, we come against, oh God, in the name of Jesus, incest, oh God. We come against, oh God, in the name of Jesus, yes, God, that spirit, Lord Jesus, oh God, oh God, of domestic violence, oh God, and we speak healing right now in Jesus' name. We thank you, God, before we know it's done. Bless your people, bless their families, bless their businesses, bless them, Lord God. Heal their bodies right now, for we command healing in their bodies and in their joints in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, beloved, as we go into, we thank and praise God for this prayer. We thank and praise God for his love. We thank and praise God for his kindness and his deliverance. I pray that you will 
take this word and that it ministers unto you. And I pray that God will cause you to think about your life with him, your relationship with him. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. And cause you to think about how you are living the life before him. As a new convert, as a believer, as one that is seeking God and seeking to know him better. As I think about my own life, I think about when I first got saved. I got saved at the age of 14. I grew up in an apostolic church. And so my apostolic background is still with me and still in me. And so I did not know that I was saved until the age of 16 because we did what was called tarrying for the Holy Ghost. And so what does that mean? That means that we called on God. We cried out to God in prayer. There was many of us, uh, young, middle age, and mostly around my time, there was a lot of young people. We were all seeking the Holy Ghost. And as we were seeking the Holy Ghost, they would tell us as we were kneeling down and calling on God and saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And and saying, hallelujah, hallelujah. And they, they taught us that when you call on him, that he will answer. And so as we continue to say, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. And our tongues got thick and we started, you know, and the more we called on God and saying, Lord, hallelujah, hallelujah, which is the highest praise as we were told. And also, thank you, Jesus. He would come in and fill us. Thank you, Jesus. And he would purge us. That means that our, our tongue got, you know, heavy and thick and he purged us of all the sin that was in us. And our, you see foam come out of the mouth of many of us and he was getting, he was cleansing us. That represented cleansing us. And then after he got through cleansing us, he would come in. Thank you, Jesus, by way of us still calling on his name and not stopping. And our, as our tongue got thick, we started speaking in another language. Thank you, Jesus, in an unknown tongue. His spirit began to fill us. And they would, the old mothers would say, fill them full, full of the Holy Ghost so that there would be nothing left occupied by the devil. And so as we began to call on him, he purged us. As he purged us and we began to speak with new tongues as he began to fill us, your ears would pop and you would hear yourself speaking in an unknown tongue. Thank you, Jesus. And so I remember that when I was 14, I didn't hear myself speak in tongues. But when I tarried again, I was tarrying that time between 14 and 16. At the age of 16, I, I received the Holy Ghost on a Monday night. And God filled me with the Holy Ghost, and I'm 54 now. And I look back on that. And how my ears popped, I heard myself speaking in tongues. Now, prior to this, I would dance and shout. And, you know, and one of my friends, she would say, who was my, um, she was, she's my good friend. And we grew up together. Her father was our minister of um, the youth. And she would say, when you would shout, she said it would be real. And I said, I know, but I never heard myself speak. And I say that to say this that when you get the Holy Ghost, you know it for yourself because his spirit will reveal it. He will reveal to you that you have the Holy Ghost speaking in other tongues. Beloved, I want to say to many of you who are seeking the Holy Ghost, and you can get the Holy Ghost by the baptism, coming up out of the water, you can get the Holy Ghost by hearing the word of God, you can get the Holy Ghost before being baptized. You can get the Holy Ghost singing up in the choir. You can get the Holy Ghost praying on your knees. I want to say this, to seek the Holy Ghost, to seek the indwelling of his spirit. Why? Because that is God's spirit inside of you. The Holy Ghost, the comforter living inside of you. And without the spirit of Christ, you are none of his. Don't let anybody fool you. Don't let anybody tell you, oh, you know, I know when he, I know when he moves on me. God forgive me because when I'm taping, 
for some reason, my tape goes in and out and it'll pause and I have to go back in. So if you hear like a moment of silence, that's what's happening. And so I say that to say that the Holy Ghost is so important. You need God's spirit. You need the Holy Ghost, which is the comforter, which is the paraclete to walk alongside to help you. You need the helper. You need the Holy Ghost, which is Jesus in spirit form. Because remember when he kept telling them, he said, I go away. If I go not away, then, then the comforter will not come unto you. So that's what he was saying. He's saying that I have to go in the flesh, but I'm going to leave my spirit. Because remember, Jesus is God. And so our topic today is a living sacrifice. And so the reason why I alluded to that was because you needed to have, you need to have the indwelling of the Spirit of God, which is Jesus in spirit form. You need to have the Holy Ghost, okay, which is the comforter to help you in your walk with with, with Christ. You need to um, have the Holy Ghost to, to be able to see Jesus someday. You have to have his spirit on the inside of you, okay, which passes from death unto life. That is the eternal life that you receive when you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And so in saying that, when we talk about a living sacrifice, what does it mean to be a living sacrifice? Well, the word living means to be um, an individual that has life, that is existing, amen. And in order to be existing, that means that you have to be alive. So when we talk about <clears throat> a living sacrifice, He's not saying, um, and we're in Romans chapter 12, and Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. Thank you, Jesus, verses 1 to 2, excuse me. And what he's saying here in these verses is that in order to be a living sacrifice, he's not, Romans was spoken by, it was the letter from Paul to the church at Rome. And so he's speaking to the believers at Rome. Rome, Italy. And so Paul is saying to them, he's not telling them to kill themselves, to commit suicide, because if you commit suicide, you cannot go back and repent and ask for forgiveness. Amen. So what he's saying here, he's saying that as a believer, he's saying as a living, breathing human being that has received Christ, that is born again, of uh, what the spirit of Christ Jesus, the Holy Ghost, he's saying to present your body he says, I beseech you, therefore, let's read it. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. Who is he talking to? He's talking to the brethren. He's talking to the brothers and sisters in Christ, okay, that are born again. He's talking to the church at Rome. He says, I beseech thee. In other words, I, I urge you. The word beseech means to earnestly request. That's what the word beseech means. It means to urge. It means to plead with earnestly. It means to request earnestly. It means to make supplication, a humble entreaty. He's asking them. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. And so when this talks about the mercies of God, let's continue. He said that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. He says, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So what is that saying here? He's saying a living sacrifice. You are alive. You are alive because of the spirit of Christ Jesus. First things first, God has to have a living, breathing, existing body to dwell in. So he, when he says that, he's talking to those that are alive physically and those that are alive spiritually, okay? Again, those that are alive physically, you are alive, breathing, because the breath of God is giving you life, okay? To be alive means to be an existing, a living, breathing, existing being. And then he says, living. That means that you are born again of the spirit of Christ Jesus. Because for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is what? Eternal life. That means that when you are dead in sin, that means that you're dead to Christ, that you don't have the life of Christ inside of you. And we know that when you're dead to sin, that means that you're alive 
to God, alive in God, and you're dead to sin. Okay, so being dead to sin means that you are alive in Christ Jesus because you're born again of his spirit and you have eternal life abiding within you. So that when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. He said, he said, repent therefore, he said, and be what? For the remission of sins, he said, and you shall receive what? The gift of the Holy Ghost. Nicodemus wanted to know how can you be born again when you're old? Jesus was talking to him in St. John 3 about being born again of the Spirit of Christ Jesus, okay, of the Holy Ghost, of the Holy Spirit. So what he's saying here is that when you are born again of God, you are not, it's, it's different from being born again when you first come in the world of the natural. Because when you're born in this world, you're born in sin, shaped in an iniquity. Because Adam ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, death passed on all of us. So in order to be born again in the spirit realm, born again through Christ Jesus, you have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You have to believe that he died and he rose again. You have to believe that he is the Holy Ghost in spirit form. So what that's saying is that for God so loved the world, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have what? Everlasting life. Everlasting life means eternal life. So what we understand is that in order to be a living, breathing sacrifice, God wants you because you are no longer, once you become born again of the spirit of Christ Jesus, you are dead to sin. You are no longer a debt, debtor to sin to live after the desires of your mortal body or your human flesh. You are now in Christ Jesus, a new creature. Second Corinthians 5 and 17 says, therefore, if any man be in Christ Jesus, he is a new creature. All things have passed away and all things have become new. So now you are living unto Jesus Christ as a living, breathing, um, born again believer unto himself. So when we think about this, Paul is addressing the church at Rome and saying, he says, I beseech thee, I earnestly request of you, and I'm asking you, I'm pleading with you. He says, therefore, brother, by the mercies of God. And when he talk about the mercies of God, we're talking about the forgivenesses and kindnesses of God. How did he show us that? He showed us that, and it's talking about the sacrifice of God. How did God sacrifice? He gave his only begotten son as what? A sacrifice. Okay, so what is a sacrifice? It's an offering made to God. And in some contexts, it also means how people make offerings to false gods. Now, what we're talking about is how we are making ourselves an offering made to God by what? Living the life of holiness consecrate life unto God. So in order to be a living sacrifice, Paul is addressing them and he's making them first think about, he says, how Christ made himself a sacrifice for us, for a dying world, for a world that had, for the Jews that had lost their way, and then for the Gentiles who are now being grafted in to be um, a people that were not a people, but are not going to, but are now have the opportunity to be a people of God. And so what he's saying here is that when you present your bodies, and he addresses it by saying the mercies of God, this is how God showed his mercy by Jesus Christ sacrificing his life for our sins. That's what he's talking about, the mercies of God, the forgivenesses and kindnesses of God. And how he did that, he offered up himself as a sacrifice in the New Testament he is that lamb of God. He is that sacrifice that, because the Old Testament, the New Testament is the answer to the Old. In the Old Testament, they would offer up lambs, bullocks, and goats as a sacrifice for the sins of the people. And they would make an atonement. And atonement meaning they would offer them up as a forgiving offering, as a burnt offering, as a sacrifice, a sin offering, okay, of giving of that of that offering for the sins of the people. And then they would take the blood of that bullock or that goat or that lamb. Now these could not have spot, blemish or wrinkle. They couldn't have any defects. It had to be uh, a sacrifice that was a perfect sacrifice. It couldn't have any 
um, defects or any uh, abnormalities with them. And so when they sacrificed, they were sacrificed for the sin first, which would be the burnt offering. It was a ceremonial uh, a procession, I want to say, or ceremonial act that took place. And so then they would take the blood of that animal and sprinkle it on the uh, four corners of the altar as the atonement. And so the fat was burnt up. And so the offering of that um, particular lamb, bullock, or goat was offered unto God for the sins of the people. Then they would take the blood and sprinkle it on the altar. Okay, the blood was representation of basically reconciling us back to God with the atonement of it also. And so then they would take another particular animal and they would pray over the animal and send him over. They would send him out into the wilderness. That animal would be for the atoning of the people. The blood would be the part that covers the sin. Okay. The sacrifice would, in order for the sacrifice to, to be accepted, they had to bring a lamb, bullock, or goat, and it had to be one that was offered unto God. So that's where he gets a living sacrifice, okay? So in order for them to offer up the sacrifice, that sacrifice had to be killed in order for someone had to die, in order for that sin to be erased, in order for God to accept that offering. It had to die. So when we think about Jesus, Jesus had to die for our sins, for the sins of the whole world. And his blood, his atoning blood, was the blood that covered us when we sinned. So the blood of the Old Testament, Testament was for the covering of that sin. The sacrifice or the offering or the offering that was made from the lamb, bullock, or goat was one that did not fight, and some some of them probably did, I want to say, but they were sacrificial offerings given up. And that's where we get, because I'm trying to get it in your head, that when these offerings were given up, they had to be, they, in some cases, some were probably, if you know a sheep, a sheep is not going to fight you. Maybe a goat will, but it was an offering that had to die. So that's where the offering comes in at there has to be the death of the sacrifice in order for there to be an execution of the sin taking place there had to be the blood covering over the four corners of the altar the blood represents the covering or the blood represents the atonement okay or the covering of the sin then when they had the other sacrifices old testament they would take and lay hands on that sacrifice and let it go free. That was the forgiveness of the sin that was made. So here it is, we see Jesus as the sacrifice all in one. He's offering himself up willingly. You have to offer up yourself willingly to God. That means that death is inevitable in order for the offering to be received. And so when he says living, he's not saying kill yourself um, physically. He's saying kill that flesh part of you that does not want to die. And so in order for Jesus to be the perfect sacrifice, he willingly offered up himself as the sacrifice. Amen. He is God. So he willingly offered up. He's God in, he's God in another form. He's God. He, Jesus is God in flesh. So the closest that we got to seeing God was through Jesus. And so Jesus being the son on the earth realm, he was still God ruling the heavens and the creation of the world. And so in the, the humbleness and the humility of the sonship, he submitted himself to himself in the Godhead. Okay, I know that's getting way into something else, but I have to make you understand that anytime they offered up those lambs, bullocks, and goats, some of them were probably unwilling, but some of them, when you think about the sheep, were willing. So you have to be willing, just like Jesus was willing to die to your flesh, willing to die to the desires of your flesh, willing to die to the carnal man, amen? In order for God to produce life in you, life eternal, as far as spiritually growing in him.
That's what I'm talking about. Because we have eternal life was sealed into the day of redemption. But when he's talking about living, he's talking about how your mind has to die to the carnal man. Your body has to die to the fleshly desires of, of the carnal man. Okay, the desires, the evil desires, the forbidden desires. So when Paul is talking to the church at Rome, he's saying, I'm, my topic today is a living sacrifice. In order for you to live unto God, you have to die to your flesh. You have to die to your ego. You have to die to your pride. You have to die to your arrogance. You have to die to the haughtiness. You have to die to, you know, to the sin character and the sin nature that is in you in order to live an effective life unto Jesus Christ. Amen. And so we understand that presenting your body means to offer up or give up. That means you have to give up the things that mean the most to you, that are causing you what? That are causing you to die spiritually in Christ Jesus. What are those things? Okay. Forbidden desires, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. Also, what else is in there? Um, fornication, adultery. What else is in there? Jealousies, envies. Okay, evil communication, profanity. Amen. Anything dealing with the sin character, the sin character in you. And so here he is. He's saying, I earnestly plead with you, or I'm requesting you, I'm asking you, I'm urging you. I beseech you, therefore, brother, by the mercies of God, by the sacrifices that he made of himself, he was in, he came in flesh, but he himself knew no sin. Amen. Jesus Christ knew no sin. He became flesh for us and he what? He crucified the flesh. Okay. And he condemned flesh. What? How? Through the cross. The cross is an instrument that is used for execution. And so he had to die to the, to the flesh part of him, my God, so that he could put to death that flesh part of mankind as in terms of living according to the sin character and the sin nature. And so then he says, he said, I beseech you therefore, by, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body. So we understand he made the sacrifice by crucifying the flesh by being that sacrifice, that perfect sacrifice, his blood, his atoning blood does what? It reconciles us back to God. So when we talk about atoning, atonement is reconciliation of God and man through divine sacrifice. And so when we think about the blood, his blood was that perfect blood that we are healed by his blood. We are delivered by his blood. The word of God lets us know that his blood covers our sins, okay? And so when he died, he was reconciling us back. He lived and he died so that he could reconcile us back to himself in the Godhead. <clears throat> and so he says here, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body. So we now understand his sacrifice, and now we're going to understand our sacrifice. Just the way he sacrificed. He's talking about sacrificing, not killing our physical body, but killing the sin nature, the sin character in us. He says that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. In other words, you are to present or to offer up or to give up your body a living offering. Amen. That's what a sacrifice is. The sacrifice, the word sacrifice means to an offering made to God. Who are we sacrificing to? We're sacrificing to God. So we're offering our bodies up to God. We're offering up our minds to God as what? An offering. That's what a sacrifice is. It's an offering. So what we doing? We are giving ourselves over to God by yielding to God, surrendering to God, submitting to God. How do we do that? By, by submitting to his word. And how do we do that? By obeying the word of God by allowing the word of God to dwell in us and to let it live inside of us and applying the word of God. So when you are a living sacrifice, you are a living, breathing human being that is now born again of the spirit of Christ Jesus. You're offering up your body as a temple. Your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. In second Thank you, Jesus. First Corinthians, I believe it is in First Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. How we are 
our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Okay? And so by our bodies being the temple of the Holy Ghost, which temple we are, he says, what know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? That means that is the dwelling place where Jesus Christ himself in spirit form is living inside your body. When you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, he says, which is in you. He says, which you have of God and you're not your own. That means you are not to your own anymore. You are not governing yourself by your own direction, by your own fleshly desires, by your own will, and by your own accord. Now you're being led by Jesus Christ when you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Your body is where Jesus is dwelling at. The Spirit of God is dwelling inside of you when you receive the Holy Ghost. So because of that, you are now not you are not governing yourself. You are allowing the Holy Ghost to lead and guide and direct you. Or you should, because that is the way God intended it for him to be. Because when he, when you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, which is the Holy Spirit, which is the Spirit of truth, he is now your director. He is now Lord over you. He's Lord over your mind, Lord over your attitude, Lord over your, um, your direction, where you go, where you live and what you think and how you should conduct yourself. He is Lord or master over you. You are no longer governing yourself or ruling your own self. Amen. Because if you want to be, if you want to see Jesus, if you want to live of the abundant life in Christ, you have to let the Holy Ghost lead and guide you. Here it is. He's saying, for you are bought with a price. How, how were we bought with a price? The price that Jesus Christ made on Calvary by giving up his himself and dying to what? Dying for our sins. When he died for our sins, he paid the price. He paid the debt that we owe. We should have been, you know, uh, on our way to hell. But he paid the debt so that he gave us the opportunity to become what? The sons and daughters of God. Giving us the opportunity to be born again. Giving us the opportunity to choose life in Christ Jesus rather than death and dying and going to hell. And so he says here, he says, for you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God. Give God the honor and the praise in your body. How do we do that? By living the life of holiness, by living the life of godliness, by living the life that is separated and clean before him. Amen. And then he says, glorify God in your body. That's how we do it, by living a holy life before him in our bodies and in your spirit so that when your when your spirit is clean then your body is going to be what clean because your spirit man filters down to your natural man amen because whatever the scripture says that that which come up out of a man thank you jesus for the things that defile not the things that go into you because they're not going into your heart they're going into your belly and they're coming out through the draw. In other words, purging all meats. That means that you are digesting things. And what happens when you digest them, they filter through. When we talk about your digestive system, we know that it filters through your stomach. It goes through your mouth, filters through to your, you know, your esophagus, going down into your belly and into your intestines. And then your intestines breaks down, you know, all the waste and what is being purged out of your bowel system is coming out of you. Amen. He's not talking about what goes in. He's saying what's, what's coming out of you because what's coming out of you is what you think. It's how you, it's what you're feeding your spirit man. Amen. Because he's talking about the spirit man. Okay. Because the spirit man, whatever is in your spirit, whatever you're looking at on television, if you're looking at profanity, looking at things that are impure pornography and, and, and delving in witchcraft and things that are contaminated, that are opposite and opposing to the um, God that we serve because he's a holy God. He's a pure God. And so it'll contaminate your spirit, the things that you ingest and the things that you partake in on a daily basis that are opposite of God. Now understand this. He knows that you're living in this natural world. That's why he's saying a living sacrifice. You have to learn how to, through the word of God, as you meditate on it day and night, and you have to learn how to have a focus that says, when the scripture talks about shun the very appearances of evil, in order to be effective 
and to be a light in a dark place. You cannot be partaker of evil men's deeds. You cannot be partaker of the corruption that is around you. And there are times that you have to basically walk away from the conversation. You have to basically, when you are in the surrounding, you have to tune out or drown out the noise that is around you. Or you have to be in a place where you ingest and say, well, you know, talk about God. Or if you talk about something other than because you can live a normal life and be in Christ Jesus and talk about the things, the things of God and talk about things that are not perverted. Things that you can have a healthy sense of humor. You can have clean humor. Amen. You could talk about, you know, the things that are going on without being in it. To involve yourself, to allow yourself to be corrupted by the environment, if that makes sense. So here it is. He says, in your spirit, which are God's. In other words, beloved, we're in this world, but not of this world. Okay? He doesn't want us to be conformed. Being The word con means to be like or have the similarity of the world. He doesn't want you to take on the spirit of of um being argumentative or the spirit of profanity or the spirit of jealousy. He doesn't want you to what take on that spirit. He wants you to be the light. In other words, representation of Jesus Christ of being the truth, speaking good, walking according to the word of God, speaking life in a dead situation, speaking healing and deliverance, speaking, you know, representation of just walking sometimes it's just the life that you live where you come in you have a positive attitude a positive mindset uh you have a positive demeanor amen and you speak life into a situation where they're always speaking negativity and your spirit is a life your spirit brings forth joy your spirit brings forth truth you're you're happy you have the joy of the lord and also you bring peace in the environment where people want to be at odds you bring that unity and say let's come together let's communicate and talk amen so he's saying here he says presenting your body a living sacrifice and we understand that he was that sacrifice so he wants us to be the sacrifice in the form of living what a holy life that is how we become a a living sacrifice being holy excuse me So in order to be that living sacrifice, we are offering up ourselves. We are, we're crucifying the flesh and the affections and the lust, the evil desires thereof. And so how do we do that? By being holy. What does the word holy mean? It means set apart from sin, worldly desires, fleshly desires. Okay. Hypocrisy also means sanctified, set apart uniquely divine, separated from sin, morally perfect, okay, in other words, being mature in our walk before Christ, consecrated unto God. That means we're, we're constantly living the word of God. We're constantly uh, allowing the word of God to, to live inside of us. And when you do that, how do you do that? At least two times a day, you're meditating on the word of God. You should have your daily prayer life. Okay, and you should also have what is called a day where you fast. You also study the word of God because the word of God is your food, it's your protein, it's your meat, so that you can know how to live a life that is holy before God. And so you know how to deal with people that are unsaved and how we deal with them. We don't look down on them, but we live the life before them, a godly life, a holy life a life that is set apart from sin. Amen. And so you are every day. God is, he's building you. He's growing you. He's cleaning you up. Amen. So every day you are that living sacrifice. Every day you are dying to what your flesh so that you are maturing in God. You're growing in God so that as you're growing in God, you're grown to be the woman of God, the man of God, the child of God that is walking in the truth of the word of God. And you are a living epistle. When people see Christ, they see they see you 
as the vehicle or the vessel that is being that is allowing God to operate in you and to use you to be the light in a dying world. And so that is what a living sacrifice is. That means that you're, you're even though you're in your body is the human flesh, you have in your 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 soul, you have the body, soul, and spirit. The soul part of you deals with the will and the emotions and the desires and the imaginations, the thoughts and the mind and the heart. Your physical body is dealing with the human flesh, okay? The desires also and the will and the intentions, but also it's the human anatomy. It's the structure of the mortal self of the living, existing man or woman, okay? The spirit is the immortal, supernatural being created by God. It is the invisible agent of God, the Holy Ghost, the spirit of truth, the comforter, okay? We talk about the spirit of God. It means God himself, okay? He's invisible. He, You cannot see him, but he exists. We talk about two types of spirits, the spirit of God, creator of all, the spirit of Satan, spirit of the Antichrist, one who opposes all this called by God and God himself. So beloved, we understand here that God justified us when he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins and for the sins of the whole world. How he did that is that he justified us by Jesus Christ, when we believe on Jesus Christ. When you believe on Jesus Christ, because you have to have faith to believe that he is the son of God, that he died for the sins of the whole world. And with that being said, we understand that he justifies us. What does it mean to justify? It means to make one righteous who was declared guilty. We were declared what? Guilty. But because we believe on the Son of God, we are made righteous through Jesus Christ. And so here we understand that that requirements for a sacrifice was that you had to die to something. You had to die and be what? An offering. You have to offer up yourself unto God. And how we do that, we execute the, the fleshly desires of our bodies. And in order to do that, we're to be a sacrifice, you're offering yourself, you're killing the part of you that represents who is master and Lord over one part of you that you are sacrificing to. In other words, you when you sacrifice to one, you are denying the other. So in order for you to sacrifice your body and give of yourself to Christ Jesus, you got to die and execute the body of sin and the affections and the lust thereof where you're serving Satan himself. And you have to sacrifice and give yourself to God. In other words, you're offering yourself to someone when you're making a sacrifice. Whether you're offering yourself to the devil as a sacrifice and doing the things of, your, of the deeds of your body, the fleshly desires and serving sin, or whether you are sacrificing to God and serving God and living holy as unto God. Either way, beloved, you're offering yourself as a, as a sacrifice to one or the other. Are you sacrificing yourself to live according to your sin character, to Satan, or are you sacrificing, offering yourself to God and living a holy and a godly life? You have to make that decision. And in making that decision, our topic today, again, is a living sacrifice. This is why Paul is saying, crucifying, you're crucifying your flesh. That's how you present your body, a living sacrifice. You are offering, you're presenting or you're offering willfully. God ain't going to put, you know, he's not going to put constraints on you. He does put pressure on you by allowing things to happen to get you back in line, to get you to serve him. But he gives you the choice. I would rather have God for me than against me. Because when God is saying that you that he wants you, he's called you to do something, whether you come kicking and screaming, he's going to have the last say so, whether it be in this life or in death, because you've got to stand before God, the deeds that are done in your body. So present means to offer, it means to give up your body, a living sacrifice, a living offering. How do we do that? By being holy. Holy means to be set apart from sin, worldly desires, 
It means uniquely divine, separated from sin, sanctified, morally perfect, consecrated to God, and then acceptable unto God. That means agreeable unto God. That means the life that we live, it has to be in agreement with the word of God. The scripture says in St. John 15, and I love this, 15 and 3, he says, now are you cling to the word that I've spoken unto you. The word of God makes you clean. The word of God purifies you. It purifies your mind. That's why I said your spirit man filters down to your natural. So that when you apply the word of God, you study the word of God and you allow the word of God to be activated in your life and you start saying, I'm going to obey the word of God. He starts changing. He starts changing your attitude, changing how your behavior he starts changing, how you look at things. And also it's teaching you to know the voice of God because the word of God is God in written form. Also, he says in St. John 15, he says, abide in me and I in you. This is Jesus talking. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, we are the branches. The vine represents the support where the branches are lodged into and connected to. And so when you're connected to the vine, which is God himself, Jesus himself, he's saying, He's saying, dwell in me and I am you is the branch. We're the branches. He said, you can't, he says, it's a branch cannot bear fruit of itself. In other words, you can't produce Christ-like character if you're not connected to Jesus Christ. If you're not connected to the support, which is the vine, which is Jesus Christ himself, which is God himself. Jesus is God. Because if you're disconnected from the vine, which is Jesus Christ, which is God himself, which is a support. That's what that vine is. Anytime you have branches on a vine, the vine is the support and the branches are connected to the vine. If you disconnect the branch, the branch itself cannot survive without being connected to the support. I'm not talking about when you cut off a root of a, tr of, um, a plant that's different. That allows you to put it in water so that it can grow. I'm talking about being lodged into the support as a branch into the vine. If you disconnect, you die and you wither. A man insists how they have been gathered and they're cast into the fire. That's why as a living sacrifice, as a, a living, existing, born-again believer, child of God, you have to offer or give up your body unto God. How do we do it? Holy and acceptable. That means setting ourselves apart from the sins of the world. That means come out from among them and be you separate. I can receive you. Then he says, agreeable. We have to agree with the word of God. In this society that we live in, people want us to agree with sin. We can't agree with sin. Sin is sin. All unrighteousness is sin. And because all unrighteousness is sin, we understand that he died. If Jesus had not died for us, beloved, then he would not, there would be no reason for us to, in other words, if Jesus had not died for sin, then everything was okay. But he died for sin because it wasn't okay. He says here, and I love how he says this, and I believe it is in, thank you, Jesus. I want to go back to Romans just for a second. He says in Romans, the I believe it's the third chapter, he says, the 21st verse, but now the righteousness of God without the law, because remember, there's the law of Moses and the law of God. He gave Moses the law. It was a tutor or a schoolmaster for them to teach them how to walk before a holy God. And it represented the word of God. Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. He, when he says he came to fulfill it and not to destroy it, he, when they, in the Old Testament, the law was put upon them until the time of reformation, time of change, because it was preparing them for a holy God that they would serve. And it was preparing the way for Jesus Christ. And so they could not understand the Messiah being, Jesus being the Messiah, because they were still looking for the law, that if you lived according to the works of the law, you were saved by the law. What this is saying is that Jesus fulfilled the law because he is the law. 
he is the word of God. And so the, the thing that happened was they had to keep offering daily, excuse me, yearly, the sins of the people with the sacrifice. The priest had to go in once a year to offer up the, for the sins of the people. And then they had to make atonement. They did this yearly. And so they had to go through the priest in order to get to God. Because back in the Old Testament, they had to, the priests were the only ones that could inquire of God for the people. And so this New Testament, Jesus is the New Testament. He is the um, Adam of the New Testament. He's the boy, he's the spirit Adam. And so what that means is that he, we don't no longer need the priest to go in for us. We can now go into the holiest of holies for ourselves. And that's in the book of Hebrews, because now by him fulfilling the law, he was that all in one sacrifice, which I explained to you earlier, how they had to offer up for this, um, the blood, the bullocks and the goats, the lamb offering. It could have any defects. He was that offering. His blood was the atoning blood that reconciled us back to himself. Okay. And so his blood covered our sins. He's that's why he says your iniquities and your sins I remember no more. He's but what he's saying here is same thing. He said, now the righteousness of God without the law. In other words, he made us righteous without the law through his son Jesus Christ. And when he says is righteousness of the law is manifested, that means it is made known by what? Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. He's saying here, he says, but now the righteousness of God, who is the righteousness of God? He's talking about the justification being defined. Jesus Christ is the righteousness of God. He says, without the law. He is the law, okay? He's being made known, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, okay? Talking about the Old Testament. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. There it is. The righteousness of God is by faith of Jesus Christ. When you believe on him, you are made righteous. That's why he says when Abraham, it was accounted to Abraham for righteousness because he believed God. When you believe on Jesus Christ, you are now become righteous. Righteousness means you're acting according to the laws of God. Righteousness means that you're believing that Jesus is the son of God that died and he rose again. You're believing by faith on Jesus Christ. And so by believing by faith, for without faith it's impossible to please God. He that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is more than to diligently seek him. So now that righteousness, that whereas we were declared guilty, we are now no longer declared guilty. We're being justified because we believe, we have faith on Jesus Christ. And so that erases what the guilt and the shame that causes us to now be in a state of righteousness. We are now in a state where we are justified by faith. That means he's making us righteous that through Jesus Christ, when we were what? We were already declared guilty. So he's erasing that by us believing on Jesus Christ and that right by us believing we're made righteous, the righteousness of God. Unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference, for all of sin and come short of the glory of God, He's saying, because we're born in sin, shaken and iniquity, he said, we are sin and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely. He offered himself freely. That's why I was saying, in order for you to be a living sacrifice, you have to be willing and obedient. You have to be willing to offer up your body as a living sacrifice. You have to be willing to crucify your flesh and the affections and the desires of your flesh. Being mean, being hateful, being unforgiving, being jealous, being prideful, being arrogant, being, you know, uh, fornication and giving of yourself to the devil. You have to be willing to live a life that is wholly set apart by God, for God. You have to be willing to be that sacrifice. Amen. And then he says, by grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, who whom God has set forth from verse, I mean, 325 of Romans 325, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. Propitiation means he is the sacrifice through faith in his blood. His blood is that atoning blood that covers us. 
to declare his righteousness for the remission, for the forgiveness of sins that are past. That means that are behind us. He says, through the forbearance of God, through what? The sacrifice, through the restraint of God. God could have killed us in our sin, but he gave his son to die for us. So that while he gave his son, he wants us, when we're born again of his spirit, let me continue on 26, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believe in Christ Jesus. In other words, God is the one that justifies us. He is the one that makes us righteous. Romans 8 and 1 says, therefore, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. We're not damned to hell anymore. We're not guilty anymore. Why? Because he justified us by faith when we're born again. Amen. There's therefore not no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And as I wrap this up, going back to Romans 12, to be that sacrifice, you have to willingly offer and present yourself, your body, a living sacrifice, living offering, holy, set apart by God, living a clean life before God, acceptable, agreeable to God, that which God is agreed with that which is in agreement with the word of God, not according to man's standards, but according to the word of God's standards. Because two saith he becomes one. When the scripture says, how can two walk except they be agreed? When we agree with the spirit of God, we are made one with God, with the mind of Christ. That's why when people talk about having a spirit of agreement, are you having a spirit of agreement to the world or spirit of agreement to Christ Jesus? You have to make that decision. And so here it is, he says, which is what? Ex re which is your reasonable service, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. It's unto God. It's not unto yourself. It's unto God. When you sacrifice, you're sacrificing yourself, offering yourself unto God so that God is well pleased, so that God is in agreement with it. Abraham offered up the firstlings of what? The cattle of that which was produced from what? as a sacrifice he gave him the first that came up first at the beginning he didn't give god his second best here it is he said which is a reasonable service reasonable that which is what when something is reasonable it's something that is acceptable thank you jesus that which god can receive if something is not received remember cain he, he gave him a chance he said if thou dost not well send it out at the door but if you continue to try to do well, he said, will not your offering be accepted? In other words, make the sacrifice, make the effort to do what is right and well pleasing in the eyes of God, beloved. That's why we offer up to God. That's why we are a living sacrifice. We are a living, breathing offering unto God. And we're trying to offer up the things that, that are hard for us to die to. Some people have the bad, a bad attitude. Some people have a spirit of unforgiveness. Some people, and there's a reason for it. But you can't stay there, beloved, because if you don't forgive, God will not forgive you. The other thing is being a person that is greedy, a person that likes the things of the world, a person that likes to smoke, drink, and cuss, a person that had harbors resentment and bitterness. And man, you got to give up those things because they're not representation, representation of the character of Christ. Giving it up means I'm offering freely unto God. And a lot of times when we're offering up, it's not easy. I get it. I understand it. But when you make the um, desire to do those things, God is pleased when you make the effort. And not only make the effort, you are following through with the execution of the plan to say, I'm giving this up. Here it is. The principles of right conduct and wrong conduct. Here it is. Forgiveness is granted when we offer unto God. Guilt is removed. Guilt is transferred. When we do what? When there is an atonement. When we give up the things that are dear to us. He says, and be not conformed. Conform, the word C-O-N means when something is conformed, the word con has to do with being changed into the likeness of what is existing. So when, when you're conforming, that means from one likeness to another. 
He's saying, be not conformed to this world. Be not conformed to the world. The word world means age, this dispensation of time, that which is trending, that which is going on in our world system today. In other words, that which is going on in this age that we live in today. Don't be conformed. Don't be in the likeness to this age. Don't do what people are doing in this age, in this world that we see right now. He says, but be transformed, be changed by the renewing of your mind. That means my mind got to be renewed. It, it, it needs to be made new again on a daily basis. That's why we have the word of God. That's why when you hear the word of God, faith come by hearing, hearing by the word of God. That means when it, your, your faith is being built and grown, Every time you study the Word of God, and when you study the Word of God, and you obey the Word of God and apply the Word, the Word of God is not effective unless you apply the Word of God. When you start applying it, it starts, it starts killing the flesh part of you that was always there from the beginning of birth, and it starts renewing you in Christ Jesus. So when I'm applying the Word of God, it's killing the natural man the natural responses of my flesh so that now I'm responding the way Jesus Christ would as his child because I have the Holy Ghost and because I'm now adopting his nature and his character and I'm replacing my old character with the character of Jesus Christ. I'm allowing the Holy Ghost to dwell in me. I'm allowing the Holy Ghost to instruct me so that when I do that, he's giving me the understanding so remember this, faith without works is dead. When you believe the word of God and you start saying, well, oh, I'm going to try forgiving. And even you're going to be tested on that. You know why? Because the word of God is going to be tested in you. How is it being tested? Are you going to live it? Are you going to apply it? Are you going to stick with it? And what's going to happen is people are going to challenge your forgiveness by doing things to you that they know is not right. And then you're going to be in a place where you have to be that living offering to say, no, I'm going to apply the word of God and I'm allow God to live in me and I'm going to forgive that person. He starts to give you understanding why that person is acting that way. You know why? Because now you're letting the Holy Ghost rule. In summation, he says, by the making new again of your mind, your mind has to be transformed by the word of God. And through the word of God, as you apply the word of God, he changes the way that you think, that you may prove what is that good, what's happening here. When you're trans transformed by the renewing of your mind through the word of God, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So what's happening is my mind is being made new by the word of God. He says, and I'm proving what is that good, that which is beneficial, and that I'm proving what is what? Acceptable and perfect, perfect meaning complete, meaning mature will of God. That's what that's doing. It's proving what is perfect, what is good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. It's proving what God's word, the will of God is God's word. It's proving what is acceptable unto Jesus Christ so that when people get ready to judge you, they're not, they can't judge you based upon the word of God, they judge you because they're angry because you're allowing God's word to be effective in you. You're allowing God's word to rule in you. So no man can judge God because God is the one that judges. Jesus said, you judge according to the flesh. I judge no man. He says, I judge. My judgment is true. In other words, my, my ability to be the lawgiver is true because I'm in alignment with myself because I'm the word in flesh. Mm. Here it is. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, St. John 1 and 1, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and it became flesh and dwell among us. Here it is, just to make a summation. Computers have to be cleaned up. Your mind needs to be cleaned up to receive new information. The word trans means to change from one form to another thoroughly or to the other side, to cross or beyond, to change a thing, to make it different. If you're going to be transformed or transform an environment, you have to first change what is in the environment. You have to remove what is in that environment 
in order for new to come in that environment. Salvation, the word redemption means salvation accomplished by paying the price for sin. The word remission means forgiveness. Christ gave his body a sacrifice for our sins. In this sinful body, he blamed sin. He became sin that knew no sin. To, to give up yourself means to yield your body's offer up as a living offering to God. Surrender, give up yourself to God. And we discussed that. Sacrifice, an offering made to God. Who are we sacrificing to? Who are we offering up to? God. We're not offering up to the devil. Because God, because God gives us eternal life. Satan gives us what? He'll lead you to hell. We offer up the sacrifice of praise in Hebrews 13, 15, and 16. Sacrifice of worshiping, thanksgiving. We yield to God. We surrender to God. We submit to God. Okay? The cross is an instrument used for execution. The word unprofitable means useless, not fruitful. Christ did not. He said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and what? Follow me. So this means separation from the world. And we discuss coming out of the world. There's a difference between clean and unclean. Beloved, a living sacrifice is one that is born again, born again believer, who is living according to God, who is offering up themselves unto God, their, their body, soul, mind, and spirit unto God. How do we do it? By being holy, by being acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service, and being not conformed to the world. You can't serve God and the devil too. You can't serve God and mammon, meaning money, at the same time. And and because one is going to be ruler over you, that's why there's nothing wrong with you having money. But you have to understand who is ruling you, who has Lord over you. Make him Lord over your life. Beloved, first things first. Obedience is yielding and surrendering to God. Agree with the word of God. He said in Matthew 18, 11, he that is not with me is against me. He that gathered not with me is scattered abroad. Beloved, any two or three of you that shall agree on anything on earth is, is touching anything that we shall ask in, in Jesus' name. He said, there he is in the midst. We want to be a living sacrifice, ex holy and acceptable unto God. Try it, beloved. Try it today. Be that living sacrifice. Surrender willingly the things of your flesh unto God and die to sin. Till we meet again, I love you to light. And God bless you a thousand times over. And pray for me as I pray for you. And we're going to be more getting better on being consistent and putting out content and putting out word and power. That's something that I have to work on. I have to do better at that. So you pray for me and I pray for you, beloved. I love you to life. Till we meet again, God bless you. Bye-bye.